Thank you. I am so disappointed I couldn't be with you in person, but I'm delighted to be streaming live to you from Silicon Valley. A little about me, this is the, the vehicle that I'm actually in. It's an Airstream in Silicon Valley. The rent is so high, it makes more sense for me to actually purchase one of these and put it in my backyard in a quiet area where I can actually do my work instead of renting an office. So that is me in sunny California. And on a personal note, I love challenges. And so I do a lot of Spartan obstacle races and fitness is really my passion. And so when I'm uncomfortable, like jumping over fire here or doing or climbing over walls or going through mud pits, that's really when I'm in my comfort zone. Now, all of this breaks down to what we're going to take a look into the future, and this is around finding a roadmap into digital. And the amount of digital technologies that are coming is increasing at such a rapid pace that it's hard to keep up. So I've created this diagram, which we will be using as our framework. And yes, everybody will get a copy of these slides, but yes, feel free to take some photos. And I'm going to walk you through each of these six digital eras. We're going to be focusing on eras four, five, and six. One, two, three, I've already come. And then after this, this section, I will also talk about what you can do inside of your company, uh, the digital tenets of a fast-growing digital culture. And I'll share some examples of what you can do inside of your company. So first, we'll look at the outside, the external market, and then we'll talk about what companies are doing internally. Sound good? And yes, it'll be interactive. Jeremy's going to be my conduit. I have some questions and polls for you. So get ready to raise your hand and give your feedback. So each of these eras poses a different question. And, and they all have questions around business models. So the first one is the internet era. What happens when the physical world becomes digital? The next one is social media. What happens when people get information from each other? Not from a centralized source. The third one is, instead of actual information, what if people get physical goods from each other? Services, homes, cars, and that era is happening now. Next, we're testing this era, the autonomous world. Instead of getting things from humans, we're now getting them from autonomous creatures. Then, and so the last four were really around digitizing the world around us. The next one is looking at digitization inside of us, and we call this the modern well-being space. What happens when we turn to technology to become more human? And then once we're done with the inner space, we're starting to focus on the outer space. Uh, we'll get to that in a sec. It seems like a lot. Well, let's break each one of these down in chunks. Okay, so if you remember in the 90s, to create a website, you needed technical skills, HTML, the, pro the server was probably under your desk. Don't knock it over because there goes the whole website. And in this era, everything started to become digital if you had the capability to publish. And we saw some massive behemoths emerge out of the dot-com blowout. The, the biggest companies in the space are Alphabet and Amazon. So they figured it out and here they are today. So I'm not going to talk about this side of the market too much because it's already come and gone. The next one is the social media era. And in 2004, there was a young gentleman who created a website called thefacebook.com where people could get information from each other. And notice now you no longer need technical skills in order to get information. Uh, you can just use these easy skills and apps in order to spread information. And this graph basically shows that uh, this internet, popu uh, internet adoption and social media adoption mirror each other. So it's the exact same thing. And in fact, I could argue that Facebook is now the internet or WhatsApp is the internet in many countries. Uh, this is a wonderful thing and a horrible thing at the same time. Now, as an industry analyst, I'm going to point out the good things and the bad things. And in this particular market, um, it's not always a good thing. So this is a, a picture of that gentleman who was dragged in front of our highest court and and asked to talk about the issues with the data, privacy, and ethics. And he didn't have a great answer. And so we're still concerned around how this information is being used. So this is one of the downsides when all of this democratized information is actually centralized under one small group of people. All right, so the third era is the collaborative economy age. This is happening now globally. So instead of getting information from peers, people are getting physical goods like Airbnb or Uber or physical um, uh, services. Let's take a look. This is a graphic I created. 
And it shows many different in- industries, 18 actually. And I plotted all of the different logos of the companies that are there. So we can see services, mobility services, food, hospitality, transportation, insurance. People were even sharing money like uh, Bitcoin or people were actually making products using 3D printers. People were getting homes from each other from Airbnb. And they're using very simple apps in order to make this happen. And we could see this uh, emerge throughout this entire ecosystem, a new economy of this peer-to-peer economy. Now, of course, uh, I was recently uh, traveling in the, the Middle East and, and in Asia, and you can see that this is happening everywhere. One of the biggest trends that we see right now are these scooters. These scooters are now the micro-mobility rage. These are happening everywhere where this is being added on in major cities and people are zipping around. Once the cities learn of this, sometimes they ban it and there's a renegotiation process. So this is certainly a trend. Perhaps it's in in Auckland. I was in Dubai um, last month and I learned about many of the startups that are enabling peer-to-peer services. This one's called Fetcher, where these couriers will go and pick up anything that you could possibly want, restaurant hotel or from a store, anything you wanted, and these contract workers would just come get things for you. You no longer needed to go to the store. Everything's on demand. And it's not really about even owning a car. You can rent a car. You can borrow cars. uh, You can use people's times on on a fractional basis. This is really the, quote, new economy that we're starting to see. Um, However, there is a downside with each one of these eras, and I always want to point these out. I want to give an honest discussion and look at these different eras. So let's compare this to our history classes of feudalism. If you remember in the European history, that the feudal age had three major layers. Let's skip the knights, okay? So let's talk about the highest level, and let's compare this to the tech scene. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions about this um, a little bit later, and I want to hear your thoughts, okay? So in the Middle Ages, there were the kings, and, and he granted the land to the different individuals to run their castles, the lords. Now, in today's era, those are the venture capitalists, the investors or the LPs. So they, you can see they're at the top of the, the pyramid. They have the most power. The next rung, these are the lords. So they run the castle, their estates. And today, these are the CEOs of the tech startups, and they're also known as the entrepreneurs. I recognize there's many CEOs in in the room today, uh, also related. Now, the third one is the serfs. And in today's digital world, these are the users. These could be the Uber drivers. These could be the delivery workers. These could be the people, the gig workers that are working remote. Now, if you can't relate, of course, to um, the king level or the lord level, then it's very obvious that one is a serf. And so let's actually plot out what this triangle really looks like in this new digital feudalism, it actually looks like this. So this is going to be another point of contention uh, that a small group of people have massive control over this new workforce. And that is going to come to a head, especially even today in the coronavirus where these workers don't have healthcare coverage in many places and yet they have to continue to work because they don't have savings or healthcare. And so you're gonna see that story come to light in the next 30 days. It's, It's gonna be quite concerning. Okay, so that's the third era, the collaborative economy. Let's take a look at the fourth one. And this is the one we're testing now. Let's zoom into that little graphic. Okay, so if you actually, let me just back up one sec. If you look carefully, um, the collaborative economy age, maybe you can see my cursor here. It's the people that are sharing things. They're on the edges of the apex of the triangle. And over here, social media, the people that are sharing things. But now in the autonomous world, notice something different. The people are being shared because the dominant creature is technology. So at the top we have at the top we have the artificial intelligence that I that sees all. And I'm sure all of you were training your AI today, right? If you use Google, Facebook or your email or Google search, you were training your AI. You're teaching it what you like. So we are all teaching the AI. Let's not pres- let's not uh, pretend that it's not around us. We're actually training it all the time. And then on the bottom, you can see self-driving cars and drones, and they're delivering people and packages and packets and, and information. So this is now being tested. Let's bring it to life. Uh, this is Cruise in San Francisco. It's a f- fully autonomous self-driving fleet, and I had the chance to get a, a sneak preview of this company, and they are preparing for 
um, GA, uh, general availability. Um, I, they probably won't go IPO now. That was in the plans with the market tanking. Uh, but then I was also in Dubai and I could see that they're testing out remote uh, test rides. And this is a goal. They want to have by 2030, 25% of all cars to be self-driving. So that's one of the most aggressive goals that I've seen from a country. Uh, they have the type of structure uh, where they can make these changes. They can make massive changes very quickly because of the way the country is set up. Um, now, I also went into the Amazon Go store. Um, if you're not familiar with the Amazon Go store, basically you use your phone and you have to first download the Amazon Go app. There's one employee that you can see and he or she instructs you how to download that app and then you sync your credit card to it. And uh, it's basically you scan it on that device uh, on the kiosk and you walk in, you grab anything you want and then you walk out. And it feels like you're actually shoplifting, you're stealing because you can put it in your bag and just walk out. There's no cashier. So I actually timed myself. How fast could I scan my app and grab a product and get out of the store? And I did it in five seconds. Five seconds. Now, in this scenario, <laughs> I don't know what I grabbed. I happened to grab some yogurt. Uh, I just grabbed what was ever as close and then walked right out. Now, if you go to one of these stores, uh, you look. if you look up, you'll see there are hundreds of eyes looking down on you. In fact, there's hundreds of cameras, and each of them are stereoscop stereoscopic. They have two uh, cameras because for depth perception. And they're watching your movement around the store, your body language. Uh, there's also sensors on the shelf to determine what products get picked up and when, when they actually move around. And this is all part of that, that experience. They say they're not looking at facial recognition. Um, I, I don't know if that's true, uh, but they are working on... Um, uh, hand recognition so you don't need a nap because there's the actual wrinkles on my hand which can be used for verification. You don't even need a phone in the future. You just show your hand on the, the scanning and you walk right out. Um, this week, Amazon announced that retailers can use this system in their own stores because many retailers were worried, how am I going to build this massive infrastructure? I don't have the technical capability. And now Amazon says, yeah, why don't you use our system? Of course, they could give the system away for free. What's most valuable is the data. So you got to think about that carefully. Okay, Jeremy, I'm going to need your help, okay? If you could help and respond to back to me as a surrogate, I'm going to poll the audience. I see you. Thank you. Okay, okay hi. So, see ya. Hi. Here's the first poll. Raise your hand if automation will replace human jobs. Any jobs? Okay, I think everyone in the audience has their hand up. Oh, thank you. All right, here's the second question, follow-up. Raise your hand if you think your job could be replaced by automation. There are 12 brave souls. <laughs> Out of a what, 300, right? Yeah, 300 okay. in this room, another 100 uh, through there, okay. so, yeah. So, so um, the, the 12, ones that raise yeah. their hands are, are showing um, the humility required to succeed in this era. Every job can be absolutely replaced, and when you talk to the AI leaders, they recognize that. Now, however, the, the things that cannot be replaced are the humanities jobs, the touching, the connecting, the, the understanding strategy, um, working with others, uh, forms of creativity and critical thinking. And um, I had the rare opportunity to be on stage with Gary Kasparov. If you know Gary, he was the one who defeated Big Blue, Deep Blue, IBM, in the chess match. He was the grand champion. And then he also lost. The story, by the way, is he lost. No, it's actually even. It's one to one but IBM doesn't tell that story. Anyway, so I interviewed him on stage and he says the future, the best chess player in the world will be a centaur, half human and half robot. And so for the CEOs, that, those 12 who raised their hands, uh, they probably have the foresight to say, how can I use AI with my job in order to advance my company? And that is the right attitude. Thank you. Okay, so we'll start a little bit more in engagement now. Let's talk about inner space. Um, now it's moving inside of our bodies. We've digitized the physical world around us. Now let's bring it inside of our own bodies. Let's take a look at the graphic. This is the next trend. So our mind is being digitized, our physical bodies, and our communities, our relationships around us, and the physical space around us. This is the, the space that is emerging now. Just let me give some examples. Um, 
Well, even before the coronavirus, Peloton was on a tear. Um, it was quickly growing. Calm and Heads Headspace are meditation apps that are worth a billion dollars and over. Um, Under Armour acquired uh, MyFitnessPal, which is tracking fitness and also diet data. And then Google acquired Fitbit just last quarter for billions of dollars. So you can see this is the next space. Um, Apple has a health kit, which is emerging. Google is collecting insurance and health data. And I can just see where this is coming. They're trying to digitize our minds and bodies. So let's take a look. This is a Vitruvian person, of course, spirited off uh, da Vinci's uh, famous diagram. But now, now, and if only da Vinci was alive to see this ring of technology around us um, that are, are coming around us. Now, um, it, by the way, we're already cyborgs. We are already connected to te technology. I can make everybody in the room really remember they're a cyborg. I could ask you to take out your phone and hand it to the person two seats down. How would you feel in five minutes, 10 minutes? We'd feel anxiety because a part of our body is disconnected from us. We'll get to that in a second. So you can see this ring of technology, the biometrics, um, there's gesture control, there's many different technologies that are emerging around us, including artificial intelligence, to predict what we want. Let me give some examples. It's in the mind space, body, community, and space. Okay, and I've um, also, what I do is I plot out the industry. That's what I do as a tech analyst. And I put all the different startups. Um, I, there was actually 2,000 startups. I brought it down to 600 in this diagram who are the fast growing players. Uh, and I published this um, recently um, in last year. And so I'm gonna be updating it as well. So you can see this is the next market that's emerging. Especially, by the way, during times of crises or a market, um, a soft market, people get sad and they can't afford healthcare in some countries, like the United States. So they turn to the most affordable, always on thing, which is this, or in this case, Wobot. What's Wobot? Wobot is a free app where anybody can now have a therapist, and their target market is teens. Teens are stricken now with depression and concerns around suicide around the globe, and they have no one to turn to. And this is a natural language processing uh, bot that has very friendly uh, ways to talk to people, and, it, and, it, and it's a non-disruptive way. It's asking you if you want to learn things to, to manage your feelings, or if you're feeling depressed, it walks you through a, a process so you can uh, try to aid your, yourself and fix yourself. And they found that the reason that... Uh, teens want to use this is for three reasons. Uh, the first one is it's always on. Perhaps when we're, when we're most depressed and I get depressed too is in the middle of the night. Nobody's around. So, but now I have this AI chat bot I could talk to you. The second thing is this. Uh, this one is free and many of them are very inexpensive unlike the $100 therapist. And the third one this one is absolutely interesting. The reason they found that many people were using these chatbot therapists is because there's no judgment. Mm. It's not a human. So this is a trend we're seeing. We're turning to robots for friendship and therapy. Now, I have a, another poll. Jeremy, I need your assistance, please. And we're going to ask the audience to raise their hand, and they can vote. I'm going to say, are you, am I talking about an infant or a phone? Um, Let's see if we can make this work. Okay. You longingly stare at it many hours per day. Raise your hand if I'm talking about an infant. Okay. Infant. Or a phone. <laughs> um, uh, a third of the room can't make their mind up. No one, okay. th no one thinks it's a baby. You know what? I'm going to have them just shout it out uh, as a group because I have five of these and I think I can hear them because uh, your mics are so good. When it calls for you, you go to it. Infant or a phone? Uh, Kiwis um, en masse whisper. <laughs> so the answer what did, was... What did they whisper? Was farm. Okay, good. When it needs energy, you feed it. Uh, we also mumble, so the it was baby. Um, it was mainly fun, but a little bit of baby. Okay, good. Um, when it when it's away from you, you feel anxiety. Uh, definitely the phone. <laughs> okay, great. And last one, it's near you when you sleep and when you wake. Yeah, fine. Okay, well we're all feeling great now. <laughs> 
Uh, so um, let's, I need to show some humility. I am so guilty of this. So my wife and I recently had twins, like very recent, like they're not even two. Uh, and they're in the other house. So another reason I have the Airstream away from the house. <laughs> and I am very guilty and I need to show more humility and put my phone down. So I am not the best father. And I just wanted to expose that I have a, myself a lot to work on. So please don't, don't feel bad. I think this really is really hammering home the point that we have already become like cyborgs connected to these devices. We can barely function without it. Uh, and the tech companies know this. And all that time they're collecting that data. Now, even more so, we're relying on mindfulness apps to ironically try to find peace within our minds uh, rather than rely on these other organizations. And the last example is there's even new technologies where you can breathe into it and this will um, determine uh, what should you eat and are you in ketosis? And this will determine when you should eat and how you should eat. So soon these devices will tell us everything that we're gonna do with the inputs of our body. So this is just the start. Okay, so I'm being mindfulness, I'm being mindful now of this. So the last question that I have, and I don't need you to answer, but it's to ponder. These tech companies are processing large sets of digital data around us. And my prediction is they will be able to predict everybody's lifespan down to the month. This is not a foreign concept. Insurance companies already have actuary data. But now, you, and that, that data is just based on historical data and reports, but now you're giving continuous flow of data and on your Apple Watch and everything around you and your searches. They know when you're sick before you tell your doctor. The question is, how much will consumers pay to get that information? Or how much will retailers pay to get that information? Or how much would you pay not to know that information? So I, I believe that is the next phase where these companies are headed. So the last digital era is off planet. And I'm not talking about um, farming potatoes on Mars, but essentially there's already technologies that will be available to all of us very soon. And this is called satellites as a service. Now, um, if you already have cameras or Nest cameras or Arlo's or Google cameras or Amazon cameras in your house, you, know, you and you're paying for this service, maybe you would also pay for a satellite looking down at your house or your farm or watching you as you take a hike through the American, uh, the amazing wilderness. Or maybe you're using this to track pa uh, traffic patterns around your house or looking for air quality or if there's a fire or disasters, how you could actually look through the smoke and find the critical things. Or maybe um, your, your herds. Uh, you have some amazing livestock in New Zealand, so you could actually track this in real time. Now, this data is actually going to be uh, available to you the first player is Amazon, and they have, uh, it's called Ground Station, and they're connecting all of the different satellites um, as uh, satellite as a service data. And you can access this, in, uh, in case you don't own a satellite, I don't certainly, uh, you can now access the data through these cloud services. So that's coming very soon. Of course, this raises incredible concerns around privacy because we can see everything all of the time, including our competitors or even enemies may have that access um, as well. So those are the six digital eras. And this is a framework to look towards the future. And I use this in my client work. And it's a, it's a great way to think about um, how are things going to unfold. Now, in the final portion, I do want to talk about, um, by the way, this is a great wrap up here of all the insights. I already went through them. But in case you wanted to look at this later in the PDF, you could. These are the answers to the questions on what is impacted and how we are impacted. So in the last part, um, let's do this poll. Um, and Jeremy, I will need your help here. And I'll go through the different eras. And I'd like for folks to actually raise their hands in the eras that your company is succeeding in now. So I'll back up and, and Jeremy, maybe you could just read them out loud and then and take a temperature of the room. Where are they succeeding? And then the follow-up question is where do they need to go? Uh, what's the one that's gonna be important? So okay, so, so, so the question, just to clarify, is, is what's your primary kind of frame of reference? Is, is that what you're asking, Jeremiah? Yes, where okay. are the CEOs and leaders today? Which era are they, are they focused on now? And you could walk through the six and just you know, gauge hands across the room, have them raise their hands. Please. Okay, great, let's start with the internet era, primary f uh, frame of reference. Uh, four people, uh, six people have their hand up, Jeremiah. We only got the internet in 2011, so a lot of people aren't connected yet. <laughs> Uh, okay. social, social media. 
Okay, so a fifth of the room, 20% of the room, social media age, uh, including my daughter Isabella. Um, collaborative economy age. Okay, there's a bold 20% who have put their hands up. Uh, autonomous world age is the primary world view. Uh, four humans and a cyborg. Modern well-being. Looks like a fairly unhealthy bunch. There's <laughs> uh, two people whose primary uh, reference is modern well-being. And off the planet. Uh, Brian Cox, uh, sorry, Brian, uh, Brian and two others. Um, check in at half past five when it's past the drinks and it might be a third of the audience. So it doesn't add up to 100%, but it seems, way, it seems kind of between two and three. Okay, thank you. I, and I think that's, a, thank you so much. And I think that's a very fair assessment where most of the companies we're, we are talking to are, are focused on those two, uh, the second and the third era. And, th and that makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and to think strategically, executives, once you, you nail the uh, social media age, peer-to-peer -peer media, then you go to peer-to-peer -peer commerce or on-demand commerce. That's a nice setup for autonomous because you're using the crowd in level three to deliver things or to share things, and it sets you up for automation. So in sequence, they work well together in your business strategy. Okay, I'm going to just move forward into the last portion. I'm going to skip these other questions and talk about what you can do inside of your company, then we'll move to Q&A. Okay. The, I, Jeremy asked me to think about how I could make it very actionable for you, not just pie in the sky future. So I have six case examples for you, uh, the six tenets of digital culture. And this is brand new content. I've never shared this in any of my speeches. You are the first. Okay. And this is based upon our research. So the six tenets, and I'll have examples, one example each. Leadership sets a digital vision. Next, number two is the data management is spread across the company. That means everybody is looking at a single source of data. Third one is the customer experience is driven by data, not guessing, not by just random creativity or trial and error. Number four, artificial intelligence scales the company and customers. Number five, you make the internal culture empowered to make these changes. And then number six is you grow an ecosystem around your company that enables innovation. I'll explain that. Okay, so the first one, leadership sets a digital vision. Uh, today's example is uh, Mr. Banga from MasterCard. And we had the chance to interview his head of innovation. And what he said is um, that, every, that their company must shift away from plastic credit cards, which is becoming irrelevant every day by day, and become a digital uh, startup. They have to do this. This is, is an imperative because they're starting to compete with Apple and Amazon and Google who now have payment programs. And so he has a dedicated budget for innovation, digital innovation. And he said, and this is public in the press, that even if the company has negative financial performance, the innovation budget will never go away. He needs to see that there's constant innovation around digital. So that is leadership at the top, a dedicated budget. That's Pretty amazing to hear. So the next one is data management across companies. And in this case, I recently interviewed uh, Mercy. They're a small hospital group in the United States in just a few, st in a, a small region. And they have done something very interesting. They are centralizing all of the data uh, around their customers. It's called the single source of truth. And that is a common term I'm hearing in our research where the medical record is centralized for all people. And in this case, they have a very unique hospital filled with doctors and nurses. It's called the virtual care center, but there are no patients, none. All of the patients who have pre-existing conditions are given an iPad for free. All patients are given an iPad and they monitor all of the data um, and the breath and the, and the blood pressure and, um, and they have regular video chats, telehealth uh, uh, with the doctors, um, all done remote. And the, and the goal is to reduce emergency room visits because they can see problems ahead of time and they can talk to nurses. And the point is that they have a single source of data uh, rather than it spread apart in a, in a variety of medical records. Number three, the customer experience is driven by data. And let's talk about Domino's, uh, who, of course, is a large company, but also a small company as well, because it's owned by franchisees. And the way this works is they were having issues with quality. 
the brand was actually in the pits. Um, some of the pizzas were fantastic. Some of them were really horrible. And those were starting, those stories were being told on social media. So what they did in order to make um, a consistent product is they installed artificial robots. You can see this on the top of that. Maybe you can see my cursor. It's called Dom. And it's a, it's a, um, camera looking down at the pizzas that come out of the oven and it uses data to see if there's the, the right amount of ingredients, are they properly spaced and is the right quantity of ingredients. And they saw that product scores went up 15% since they put in Dom, the AI pizza checker. And also the photos were sent live to the customer so they can see how it was happening. So they use machine learning to improve quality. Next one, artificial intelligence scales the company and the customers. So Stitch Fix, this is a company that will has access to millions of pieces of apparel, and there is no physical st store. And the way it works is it's all digital where you are paired with stylists, and he or she recommends clothes to you. But they can't possibly know, so they use artificial intelligence. And I believe this is one of the largest set of data scientists in a virtual real uh, uh, retailer, especially around apparel, they have about 115 data scientists that are creating algorithms in order to determine what types of clothes that you want now. But they also predict, based upon what you have purchased and tried on, what you're going to need in the future. So it impacts their supply chain down the line. Next, internal culture empowerment. The leader here in the space is a mid-sized company called Adobe. Um, certainly, you've heard of them, but they're not that big. Um, and what they've done is their head of innovation, who I've interviewed, wants to encourage all employees to innovate and come up with new products. And they created a class called the Kickbox, where you go into this class and everybody learns the basics of A-B testing or generating wireframes or doing surveys with customers or focus groups. And you're actually given this physical box. And the head of innovation says, I'm teaching you how to innovate. And you don't have to be in the product team. You can be in any department. It doesn't matter. HR, sales, facilities, it doesn't matter. And please don't come back to me unless you have a problem. But I, I don't want to be the bottleneck for innovation. I want to read a, about your innovation in the press release. So that's his vision. He wants a thousand innovation flowers to bloom. Everybody in the company is empowered to innovate. So you receive this actual box, and it has a Starbucks card, um, some chocolate and diagrams, and a credit card with $1,000 in it. So you can test your proof of concepts and get actual data and pitch it to your direct manager, not to the head of innovation. The job is to empower it at each segment of the company. Um, proof points, they have... Many uh, new patents that have emerged from this and people have been promoted and they continue to innovate. So the last example here is an ecosystem of innovation. Uh, Johnson & Johnson was the first to launch the J-Labs and they have around 10 locations around the globe. And these are physical labs that have a million dollar equipment in it, lab equipment, and they are catering to startups in the ecosystem who can rent space from the J-Labs and they can have access to this expensive equipment. There is no equity exchange or they do not have to take investment from J&J &J, &J, and there is no um, forcing of the IP being shared. And here's the clincher. They even allow competitive startups into the labs. Can you imagine your company as an executive, would you allow competitors to set up shop in your company on site? Would you do that? Now, why would J&J &J do that? Well, here's, here's what they did. They did that and they swept the entire innovation ecosystem. All the biotech startups are now attached to the J-Labs. Johnson & Johnson's pharmaceutical competitors have to walk into their offices and check in to visit these startups. They have swept the market because they were open to competition. So to bring everything to a close, those are the six tenets of digital culture. Um, I'm going to close with the final takeaways. The first two phases, backing up to my first section, the internet and the social era, caused significant changes in society and business. But now today we're focused on the collaborative economy, the on-demand and peer-to-peer -peer commerce, and that leads to the autonomous world. And in both cases, that means that commerce moves faster and faster and faster. Now prepare for the inner space as tech moves into our minds and our bodies. And then, of course, the next one is um, outer space. And it starts with getting data, looking down uh, on New Zealand and your global expansions. That's coming very fast. You must deploy those six tenets of digital culture 
and that will help your company to be faster and more scalable and frankly, more agile. All of those things will help you to be uh, continue to be the amazing fast growth companies that you are. Use this map as a guide, not just for your company, but for your career. And I hope this really helps you to chart towards a path during times of uncertainty. Thank you so much. Wow. Uh, that was fantastic. That, that last slide was a real build with those six tenants. Um, just a question, what are the standout of those six? You know, if, if you had to really, if you had to really win in, in, in one or two of those spaces over the next five years, what, what, what do you think people, how, how do you think people should be thinking about, because no one can be great at everything, right? Or are these things a system well, that you've kind of put, I, you know, put together? The only companies that can be great at it are like the hyperscalers, Google, Amazon, and Apple. They're literally doing all six now. So um, the place to focus is where the collection of the data, and that would be the autonomous world age. If I had to place one bet, it's that one, this blue one, autonomous world age. Okay, AI. okay, and there's six tenets as we go forward. You know, we've been mm -hmm. talking a lot about strategy and about uh, learning to imagine a future state and opportunities that come out of that. Um, in terms of this digital vision idea, I mean, MasterCard, you kind of see it because it'll be their Kodak moment if they're still stuck with plastic when everyone's, you know, moved on to a digital space. But what are some other examples that you've seen of a compelling digital vision that has been empowering for a company and its go forward? There's a, a small uh, growing company called Panera Breads. Are they in New Zealand? Uh, not yet. Okay, so please take a look at them later. Panera, P-A-N-E-R-A. -E and they are trying to make their experience as digital as possible. Uh, I would say they're the next Starbucks. And they focused on bread-based products. Of course, they have coffee. And they have kiosks where you can check things in and they're looking at your phone with an app and they're trying to predict what do customers want before they walk in the store. So that will be the next phase, predicting uh, customers. And that's all being done through data and AI. So I think that's one great example of a small, fast-growing company, Panera Bread. And just a basic question, with that Amazon Go, you said the cameras are everywhere because they're looking at behavior as data. Well, what are they, what are they how, how, do you, uh, how do you expect them to be using that? Why do they want to see what I reach for and pick back? Mm -hmm. how, how can that be useful? When you're yeah, thinking about retail very and, and commerce. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, that, it, that really aids the checkout experience because you don't need to check out products with RFID or actually scan anything because they see what you've, you've grabbed. For example, if I grab this little bar, they see I've physically taken that and they can see the shelf has changed weight or that there's nothing on the shelf so they assume that that person has it. You can actually put those products in your, in your backpack or your pocket and walk out. You don't have to have visible and that's because of the cameras that are tracking. Okay, so that's just the most obvious kinetic ones but the most important data that I believe they can track is the facial data. Did you know there's 111 micro expressions? <laughs> and that's being tracked by AI. I've seen the lab, the tests in the labs. And so basically means there's no lying. So Jeremy, we could find out right away using those technologies, which product do you want? I could show these up and watch the micro expressions in your face and I can change positioning, packaging, pricing, or uh, assortment. And that will eventually happen in real time. So if commerce is an algorithm, it helps you kind of optimize amongst the the choices, the micro choices mm -hmm. that people are using. Um, you said, you know, now with the with the system, with investors and entrepreneurs and 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 you know, effectively modern day serfs, that a small group of people have massive influence over employees. Hasn't that always been the case? What's new? That's true. It, it is true. I, I think that the change here is that the that the the digital zealots were so excited with the opportunity of digital to democratize and empower everybody, but in reality, it just created some new barons. That, you know, the, the people who run Facebook and Google and, and Uber. Uh, you know, the it just shows that capitalism happens over and over. And and when you take the pulse of Silicon Valley in terms of thinking about privacy. Without you know pulling out any companies, you can't do that. But are people going 
let's see what we can get away with. Let's try and hack this privacy stuff because the more we find out, the more we can sell or use that information. Or are they mm -hmm. actually going, we need to be really respectful of this stuff or we'll blow up? I think it's a combination of both. So I think they're trying to push it as far as they can to, uh, because they're public companies, they have to generate profits for their, their uh, shareholders. But you can see which business models are aligned towards data exploitation, uh, exploitation and those are the social networks. That's, it's very clear. However, the premium products like this Apple phone, you are paying, I paid $1,300 or more, I'm sorry, I don't know. It was a, it was a lot for this phone, um, but it's very clear on their business model when it came to privacy. I paid for it when I bought the phone. I am not concerned with Apple around my data privacy. They don't need to monetize my data. They've already monetized the phone. So I think it depends on the business model that you'll find the DNA of how they'll use the data and privacy. But, but I think the point still stands. Um, those companies are centralized on the West Coast of the US. So if, if you're not collecting data right now about your market, and if you don't do that now, I'm speaking to all the CEOs in the room, then you're gonna to have to buy it from those companies. And that's a danger. So I'm really encouraging you to own and foster and govern your own data. And going to your view of satellites as the kind of the God view. So is it wrong for us to think about these companies as space companies? Are they actually just satellite companies? And they are, they are, um, that's true. But the, what I didn't, sh I didn't have enough time to show that they're, that's just phase one. Like the, that's how they get the satellites into orbit is by offering an, um, internet access to areas that don't have internet like Africa under the guise of we're democratizing information or two, we're gonna sell back data. But of course, when you look carefully, the same people who own those are trying to you know, do weird things and colonize. Uh, so. Blue Origin and, and Elon Musk. So you can see they literally want to go into another planet. So that is related. But I, I didn't have enough time to explain all that today. <laughs> okay. Um, and you, you made a throwaway line about the coronavirus in terms of some of the types of unexpected impacts that you can see downstream. Uh, sure, we can from talk a, about it. From an economic or from a consumer behavior point of view, what do you... Uh, what, 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 do, what, what do you think some of the ripple, possible ripple down scenarios may be and what type of time frame are you, are you thinking about? Oh God, it, it's happening so fast. Um, if you look at the charts on, on, the, the, on how fast it's happening, the awareness of, of finding them, it's, it's a hockey stick. And I was looking at the data today. So I, I, I'm speaking to the amazing leaders in New Zealand. Please don't take this lightly. Uh, yes, the death rates are far below some other serious things, but it, it destroys the, the medical community so fast that those that need the medical care can't get it. So we're already seeing the supply chain breakdown of the healthcare system. They're getting ready for that. Um, even today, the National Guard is being sent into New York. Right? That's all breaking before this call. So it's serious. So the, the obviously work at home has exploded. The companies that offer telecommunications, um, wh whether that's Wi-Fi or, or home-based networks or uh, collaboration tools, their stocks have quickly gone up. Of course, medical supplies and basic necessities, even Campbell's Soup stock went up, which was surprising. Um, many other companies uh, went down. Um, oil um, supply chain impact. We, I spoke to somebody who works at the digital ads companies at one of those big companies that you know about, and they're actually seeing marketers pull back ad dollars because the supply chain from China has re been reduced. So I'm already seeing that emerge. Um, so those are some of the impacts and it's going to last for um, a significant amount of time. Obviously the hospitality and travel industry is, is busted. It, it is blown out uh, quite severely and there's a major economic impact from, from that as well in travel. Um, the airports in San Francisco were at 40% capacity on Friday. So obviously you can hear I'm, I'm closely following this and it's, um, it's, it's very serious. Yeah, and thanks, thanks for that insight. So Jeremiah, just uh, going back to, to that phasing, um, we, should be, we should be seeing opportunity in this or should we be kind of oh, yes. being kind Absolutely. of cautiously mindful of these, of these forces? Oh, it's absolutely opportunity. Okay, so I just wanna reshare that the screen here of the six eras. Um, if, if I can give you the dates, the winners for each of these eras, the first three eras, 
happened in the recession? Absolutely. Okay, so 2001 was the blowout recession. That's when we saw Google and Amazon emerge in that era. Social media age, people wanted to connect and it was cheap to connect using social networking. That emerged, they came in 2004, the dominance came in 2008. Collaborative economy, Airbnb birth in a recession that they literally didn't have enough space at a hotel, it's too expensive, so that company came out of that. So the next billion dollar companies come out of this next down soft market, if that's where we're headed, and it looks like we are. So I only see opportunity. Because it's companies responding to their, the bets they're playing around changes in consumer behavior. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, it's, or it could be B2B, it could be supply chain too. But anywhere where we see the ease reduction of so in each of those cases, there's a middle person that's been cut out. It might've been a communication middle person or a commerce middle person or a, a big institution that failed like banks or hotels. So people turned to each other, they had the cheap tools to do it. So if, and you can see how modern well-being, if America, the healthcare system is really struggling, um, we can talk about that another time. So you could see modern well-being is gonna pump up really fast in this downturn because healthcare is about to get overrun in the next month. So I already see the opportunities how this is gonna play out. Well, it's a very powerful framework you've shared with us. We would have loved it if you could have joined us, but thank you so much for Next beaming time. in and uh, for sharing that with us, Jeremiah. That was awesome. Thank you.